Hello, and welcome back to Voices of Worship, Hymnology Unveiled. Now, I had a great vacation the last three weeks, and we're back, ready to start a new Bible study on I Stand Amazed, or also known as My Savior's Love. Now, this song was written by Charles Hutchinson Gabriel, who lived between 1856 and 1932. Now, Gabriel was known for his contributions to gospel music, both writing the lyrics and the melodies of, of several songs. This one also is commonly known by one line in the chorus, which says, how marvelous, how wonderful. Now, on our vacation, besides getting to see our son and daughter-in-law, we got to see parts of the country that, that we'd never seen before. We were in places that, that some of the buildings were in existence, or parts of the buildings, I should say, were in existence when Jesus and the disciples walked this earth. It was pretty cool. We were in, our, the last week we were in Rome, and it was just so amazing to to see the Colosseum and and all of those things that that were around back in in Bible times. And while while I <laughs> stood amazed at those things, those those buildings or those those ruins of those buildings, or even the the landscape in Germany and 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 things like that, the beauty of God's creation. I'm more amazed at my Savior's love. So let's get into some of the history of this song before we go into the lyrics. Now, the hymn was published in 1905 at a period during which gospel music was was really flourishing in America. Charles Gabriel was heavily involved in writing both the hymn lyrics, as I said, and composing the music for evangelical purposes, he contributed over 7,000 gospel songs. Let that sink in. That is a lot of songs. I've written a few, not hymns, but <clears throat> I've written a few songs. But 7,000 songs, actually over 7,000, that, that's amazing to me. Now, his works were, as I said, commonly used in evangelistic campaigns, revivals, and church worship settings. This song, I Stand Amazed, quickly became popular in, in various Christian denominations because of its emotional and reflective portrayal of Christ's sacrificial love. Now, Charles Gabriel was was a central figure in American gospel music during the 19th and 20th centuries. He was born in Iowa, as I said, in 1856. He began his musical career at a very young age in church music, composing and writing hymns by the time he was a teenager. And he's largely self-taught in music, which is really cool to me. But his, his talent was evident at a very early age. And he began teaching in, in different aspects, um, teaching music and teaching singing and things like that. He was deeply involved in evangelic, evangelical circles. And he worked with organizations such as the Methodist Episcopal Church, and also evangelistic groups led by figures such as Billy Sunday. His hymns featured themes of Christian love, salvation, and devotion. And I Stand Amazed is one of his most popular works. Now, some of his other works you might be familiar with are Send the Light, His Eye is on the Sparrow. He did the music for that one. And since Jesus came into my heart, which we studied before. 
But the hymn, this hymn, I should say, centers around the awe and amazement felt by the deliverer in, or not (laughs) by the deliverer. I just realized what I said. By the believer, not deliverer. I knew what I was meaning to say. But it, by those of us who are singing it, those who us are, who are taking those words to heart, but it, we're contemplating Christ's love, particularly his suffering, his death, and and his eventual glory. Now each verse recounts different aspects of Jesus' journey to the cross and his redeeming work for humanity. And the, the chorus, or the refrain as it's also known, is repeated throughout, and it, it reinforces that, that personal response of worship and gratitude. Now, verse 1 says, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean. So verse one sets the tone by focusing on the amazement at the love of Jesus, despite our, our own personal unworthiness. It talks about being a sinner condemned unclean. So how does this reflect key biblical teachings about sin and redemption. I'm glad you asked because we're going to look at some. In Isaiah 64.6 in the New International Version, it says, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our, un- and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf And like wind, our sins sweep us away. This this scripture really echoes the fact that we are unclean and unworthy before God. Even the best of human efforts, of our efforts, are compared to filthy rags in contrast to, to God's holiness. Yet, despite our unworthiness, the hymn speaks of Jesus' love for us, which is a reflection of of God's redemptive grace found throughout Scripture. Now, let's look at some more Scriptures that that we find His grace in. In Romans 5.8, in the New Living Translation, it says, But God showed his love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And then in Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, also in the New Living Translation, it says, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. I love that scripture because it talks about God's love and his mercy in saving us even while we were spiritually dead in our sins. It <clears throat> highlights the, the contrast between our sinful nature or our sinful state and God's grace Similar to the the amazement expressed in this first verse of the hymn at Christ's love for sinners who are unclean and condemned. Without his love and without his grace, we were doomed. We were dead in our sins. But God was so rich in mercy and he loved us so much. That he gave his life for us. How marvelous is that? Uh, 
Verse 2 moves on to say, For me it was in the garden. He prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. Now, verse 2 recalls Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, emphasizing his, his selflessness and the, the deep suffering he, he endured for humanity. How does, how does the imagery of Jesus praying, not my will but thine, deepen your understanding of, of s- submission and sacrifice? Now let's look at the scripture where he prayed this. It's in Luke twenty two forty two. 42. I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. It says, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. That amazes me. You know, Jesus had the choice. He could have said, I don't want to do this. Take, said, I'm going home. And he didn't have to suffer for us. But he said, Father, I'm willing. I will do what you want me to do, even though I don't want to in my human state. That amazes me. Then we look at Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. In the New Living Translation, it says, Though he was God... He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. (sighs) Wow. This highlights the, the ultimate submission of Jesus. Now, even though he was God, he chose humility and obedience to the point of death. It reflects that, that same mindset as we see in Gethsemane where Jesus submitted to the Father's will, choosing sacrifice over self-preservation. I don't often choose sacrifice over self-preservation. I'm going to tell you that right now. I'm human. But Jesus, being fully human and fully God, chose to sacrifice, even though humanly he would like to have gotten out of it. Now, in Hebrews 5, 7 through 8, in the New Living Translation, sorry, my fan is making my hair tickle my nose. It says, while Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. <laughs> Do you get that? Do I get that? There's hair on my mouth. Um, I want to read that, that, that last sentence again of that, of verse 8 in Hebrews 5. Even though Jesus was God's son, let that sink in, Jesus was God's son. He learned obedience from the things he suffered. Wow. So this passage directly refers to Jesus' prayers and suffering, emphasizing his submission to God's will. But it also shows that, that his suffering was, was part of learning obedience, 
deepening the the significance of his his prayer in Gethsemane and illustrating the profound sacrifice involved in yielding to God's plan. Do we learn obedience through the things that we suffer? If we if we look back on things that we've gone through, do we see God's hand and, and where he led us? I was, well, actually, my, my husband was talking to his brother, and there was some flooding in the area that, that they live in, and which is kind of amazing. But anyway, there was f- some flooding in the area that they live in. But then my sister-in-law posted these pictures of a house that they had tried to buy some property that they had tried to buy two years ago. And she said that God had a better plan because that property was flooded. Their home that they live in, that they still lived in back then, was fine. But that property that they had tried to buy and they were so disappointed that they couldn't get it, God had a reason for them not getting it. Yeah, it's messed up for the people who do who did buy it, but they are okay. But we can look and see that that God had a plan, that God had a purpose, that they didn't get that because this flood was going to happen and it would destroy all everything. So, do we look back on on our situations in life and see that that God has saved us from things that that we may have wanted. I wanted to marry uh, this other guy before I met my husband. I had planned to marry him. I thank God I didn't get what I had planned because I would have been a disaster and I wouldn't be where I am today, almost 36 years of marriage. But you see, God sees the bigger picture. We don't. And, and because we can see that, that Jesus prayed Lord, God, Father, I, I don't want to go through this. I, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through this pain and this sacrifice. But God, not my will, but yours be done. So you see, if Jesus felt that way, if Jesus, being fully God and fully man, felt the pain and and felt the indecision and and felt the desire to get out of what he knew he was going to have to go through you see god understands when we don't want to do this stuff that he wants us to do but what he's looking for is a willing attitude a willingness saying lord not my will but yours be done that's in our hearts and god's going to take care of us regardless of what he has planned for us to go through So now let's move on to verse three after I get a drink. Verse three says, in pity, angels beheld him and came from the world of light to comfort him in his sorrows. He bore for my soul that night. Now this verse it doesn't seem to be in most hymnals, but the words just really get me that last line, especially <clears throat> that he, he bore those sorrows for my soul. He bore those sorrows for your soul. Let that sink into your mind and your heart right now. Angels came to comfort him because he bore sorrow for our souls. So that gives a a different perspective on the sorrow that Jesus bore. At least for me, it does. 
to know that that angels you know I've, I've read the scriptures I, I read Luke 22 43 in the New Living Translation says then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him and this is talking this is right after he was praying in gar- the Garden of Gethsemane that this cup would pass from him that he wouldn't have to go through this and then angels came to strengthen him. So looking at that, first let's look at, at the fact that he bore that for our soul. Our souls, my soul, your soul. These were what the sorrow was about. He bore our sorrows. He was going to be taking on our sins, our pain. Our pain alone, one person's pain alone and sin alone is hard enough to deal with. But he took it on for everyone in the entire creation throughout eternity from beginning to the end. He took that on. All of that sin, all of that pain, all of that suffering, all that sorrow, he bore that for us. Now, how do you understand the, the role of angels in, in the, the grand narrative of Scripture? We already read Luke twenty two forty three, 43. So let's move on to Matthew four eleven in the New Living Translation. It says, then the devil went away, and angels came and took care of Jesus. Now, this verse occurs immediately after Jesus was in the, in the desert fasting for 40 days. And he was tempted. And, and, and if you want to go back and read Matthew 4, you can go ahead and read that. And it talks about the, the temptation of Jesus in, in the wilderness by Satan. So, so after enduring the, the temptations from Satan, angels minister to Jesus, most likely providing the, the physical and emotional strength he needed to continue his earthly journey and his earthly ministry. So that, because remember, as we said before, he was fully God, but he was also fully man. And he had a physical body that, that needed nourishment, needed strength, needed, he had emotions just like we do. Because he was fully human and he was fully God. I know that's hard to comprehend. I don't get it. But I know that that's what it, how it was. But he, he went through this stuff so he would know what we go through. So this shows that angels were involved in providing for Jesus in moments of... of Weakness, this is the human side, weakness, vulnerability. We don't see Jesus as being weak, and we don't see Jesus as being vulnerable. But the human side of him, not the God side of him, God is not weak and God is not vulnerable. But Jesus had to go through that, through that weakness and that vulnerability, so he would completely understand what we as humans go through. But angels came to minister to him after he'd gone through that. So what does that say? It says that, that, that God uses his angels to help us. And we're going to look again at, or look at Matthew 26, 53 in the New Living Translation. It says, and this is Jesus talking. It says, don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly? Now, Jesus here is talking to his disciples during his arrest. And he's making it clear that he could call on an overwhelming force of angels to protect him if he wanted to. And while He did not call on them. This verse underscores the the power and the 
presence of angels ready to serve him, reinforcing their, their readiness to assist at any moment. Now, there are other scriptures that talk about angels being there for humans. Uh, we look in Genesis 19, 1 through 3. I'm not going to read it, but it talks about angels save Lot and his family. In 1 Kings 19, 5 through 7, an angel ministers to Elijah. In Daniel 6, 22, an angel protects Daniel in the lion's den. In Acts 12, 6 through 11, an angel rescues Peter from prison. And in Hebrews 1, 14, angels are, are depicted as servants of God's people. And it says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So that verse summarizes the, the, the broader biblical teaching that angels are sent by God to serve and minister to believers in Christ. So it shows that they have an ongoing role in assisting and, and protect, protecting God's people, even if their work goes unseen. So these examples show that angels frequently intervene to protect, guide, and minister to ordinary people throughout Scripture. So that their role is showing God's care and involvement in the lives of his people. And it, they're often providing help in miraculous or supernatural ways. So just as they, as they came to minister to Jesus in his human state, they come to us as believers, even if we don't see them, even if we don't realize it, God sends his angels to be with us and to guide us and to help us, to comfort us, to protect us. We also have the Holy Spirit to do all of that too. He has not left us alone. He did not leave Jesus alone. He's there with us. Now, verse 4 says, He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Now, Verse 4 depicts the ultimate act of love, which is Jesus' carrying of human sin and sorrow to the cross, where he suffered and died alone. He didn't stay there, but he did. But it highlights Jesus taking on my sins and my sorrows. So, when you look at that, that line, taking on my sins and my sorrows, how does this reflect the theological concept of, of substitution, let's see if I can say the word, substitutionary atonement? Now, I wanted to look these terms up because I wanted to explain them. The term substitutionary refers to the act of taking the place of someone else or something else. Now, specifically, substitutionary means that Christ suffered and died in our place as a substitute, taking upon himself the sins of humanity so that we might receive forgiveness and reconciliation with God. He stood in for us. He endured the penalty of sin, which is death, so that we rightfully could experience God's forgiveness. We, we should have experienced the penalty for our sins, but Jesus substituted for us. He stood in for us. He took our place. And because he did that, because he fulfilled 
God's justice by taking, by being that sacrifice and standing in for us, it offered salvation to us, forgiveness and reconciliation to God. Now the, the term atonement, I'm sure most of us know what that means, but it refers to the process by which reconciliation is made between two parties. So the word atonement can be understood as bringing two estranged parties, God and humanity, back into harmony. So in the, in the context of, of Christianity, atonement involves paying the penalty of sin. Jesus' death on the cross serves as the payment for the sins of humanity. And then restoring the broken relationship. So he, through his sacrifice, Jesus bridges that gap that's caused by sin and allows people to be reconciled with God. So that's what substitutionary atonement means. You put those two words together, and it means that Jesus was our substitute. He took our place and made us the sacrifice and atoned for our sins before we even committed some of them. Isn't that awesome? But we still have to ask for forgiveness. But let's look at Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 in the New Living Translation. It says, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Then in 1 Peter 2, 24, in the New Living Translation, it says, He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. Now that verse highlights Jesus' sacrificial act of Carrying our sins on the cross. It shows or directly shows that that substitutionary atonement that we were just talking about. Showing how Jesus took our sins so that we could be healed and live for righteousness. The phrase, by his wounds you have been healed, also goes back and echoes that verse in Isaiah 53, verse 5, reinforcing the, the connection between Christ's suffering and our redemption. Then we look at 2 Corinthians 5, 21, also in the New Living Translation. It says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now here, Paul is emphasizing that, that Jesus was made sin on our behalf. Even though he himself was sinless, he was made sin. Now, in different versions, it says, NLT says to be the offering for sin. Other versions says that he was made sin. I think NIV says that, and a few others do too. But he was made sin. He took on all that sin, as we talked about earlier, the sin of all humanity throughout time, from the beginning to the end. He took on all that sin, all that pain. <coughs> Even though he himself was sinless. So, this passage explains the, the, the essence of the substitutionary atonement that Jesus takes on our sin and in exchange we receive the righteousness of God we are made right with God through Christ this um, great exchange as we'll call it is really at the heart of the gospel and it's, it, it's beautifully reflected in, in the hymn's portrayal of 
Jesus carrying our sins and our sorrows. We cannot be made right with God without the sacrifice of Jesus and without believing in him. He took our place. He made the sacrifice for our sins. Think about that. Now, verse 5 says, When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, t'will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. So verse 5, after you look at all the atonement and all the sacrifice that Jesus made, verse 5 looks forward to that future hope of seeing Jesus face to face in heaven, in glory, and praising him and his love eternally. So this final verse looks forward to eternal praise in heaven. So what scripture passages can can we find that talk about worshiping forever and seeing him face to face? Again, I'm glad you asked because I have some. They're all in Revelation, and they're all in the New Living Translation, although the other translations say the same, basic same thing. But let's look at Revelation 7, 9 through 10. It says, After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes, and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from God, who sits on the throne, and from the Lamb. Then in Revelation 21, 3-4, it says, I heard a loud shout from the throne, saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And then, in Revelation 22, 4, it says, And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. We will see Jesus face to face if we are believers in him and we endure till the, till the final day when he comes back for his people. This is our promise. This is God's promise to us. And that is our hope of glory. Seeing him face to face. As the, the song says, when with the ransom and the glory, his face I at last shall see, t'will be my, song, my joy through the ages to sing his love for me. I can't wait for that day. Can you? Now, we know the chorus, or refrain as sometimes the the songs call it, is repeated after each verse. The verse, sorry, the chorus says, How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Now, to me, the words of of the chorus become very personal. It's recognizing how how marvelous and, and wonderful Christ's love for me truly is. He gave everything for me. How can I not... Praise him for all he has done. This will be my song forever. The the repetition of the words, how marvelous, how wonderful, emphasizes both the, the, the awe and the gratitude that naturally flow from recognizing the depth of Christ's love. When we truly grasp the extent of his sacrifice, 
how he gave everything enduring the cross for our sake, it becomes deeply personal. You see, the, the, the course is an invitation to respond with unending praise as we realize that Christ's love is, is not just a theological concept, but it's a personal reality. He loves us individually. He bore our sins and our sorrows so that we could be reconciled to God through him. And it is only by him and his sacrifice that we are saved. So it is only by our belief in him and our faith in him that we have that personal relationship with him, with God, with the Holy Spirit, all of that. So when you consider that, that this love motivated Jesus to give up everything for us, then the, the only fitting response is heartfelt worship. In Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, out of the New Living Translation, it says, Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. You see, the more we, we reflect on God's goodness and Christ's sacrifice, the more compelled we are to praise him for all he has done. So let me ask, does reflecting on the chorus inspire you to express your gratitude to Christ in a specific way? Does it inspire you to express that through worship or service or some other personal response? Share that. Share. You can leave it in the comments. You can, you can express your, your, how this inspires you and realizing what God, what Jesus did for us, what he did for you. How does that inspire you? As you see, as we summarize this song, this, this beautiful hymn, I Stand Amazed, or My Savior's Love, it's a hymn that, that, that marvels at the depth of Christ's sacrificial love for humanity. And it reflects on Jesus' suffering, particularly in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it also looks at his carrying of our sins to the cross and his ultimate act of redemption through his death and his resurrection. And the, the chorus expresses that awe at the love of Christ and, and the, the, the love that he displayed by sacrificing for us. But it calls us to action. It calls us to unending praise in response to what Christ did for us. So <clears throat> with its forward-looking final verse, this hymn anticipates the eternal joy of worshiping Jesus face-to-face -face in glory, making it a, a powerful expression of gratitude and devotion. So one last question. How does this song motivate you to worship God? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for this time that we've had to study your, your word and, and this hymn and, and just learn what it means to, to praise you and worship you for the sacrifice that you made and to know that you did it for us personally. It's not... It's not just a collective thing, but it's a personal thing. You did it for us personally. Lord, I pray that each one listening would, and watching would, would take these words to heart 
and take these scriptures and, and the lyrics to this song to heart and help them to, to inspire them to, to worship you and to not just hide it, not just hold it in. Yes, we need to worship you individually, but we need to share that worship and share what you've done for us. Lord, give us the courage to, to spread your love to the world around us. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I thank you for joining me once again for Voices of Worship, Hymnology Unveiled. And if you've gotten anything out of this, I encourage you to share it with others. It is on multiple social media platforms, so you can find it. Go to my website, phyllisjolliffe.com. You'll find all of my social media connections listed there. You'll also find connections to both of my stores. I have two different stores. Most carry the same things, but the one on my Etsy shop carries a few extra things that I don't carry on the other shop. So check them out. You might find something you like. We have things like this shirt, um, other things that, that would encourage you to, to share God's word and share his love to others, sometimes without even saying a word. Thank you again for joining me, and I will see you next time for our next study. God bless.